morning we're looking at just a few verses again in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 14, looking at verses 12 through 16. Again, all of these passages are leading up to the Last Supper, leading up to the betrayal of our Lord Jesus Christ, to his crucifixion and the atonement by which we are saved. But it's interesting how things develop along the way and how we have these wonderful examples of how the Lord is actually shaping all these events to bring about that one end, which is, of course, the salvation of his people. Everything that's taking place here is taking place according to his will. And we have one, again, one great example of that this morning. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we're told in our text that as events continue to move on, that this was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread the day when the sacrificial lamb was going to be sacrificed and the Passover meal to be celebrated, to remind the Jews as the Lord had commanded them to remember the redemption of the Lord, of his people out of Egypt. I think you know uh, very well by now that this ultimately was pointing to the redemption that the Lord was going to send his people through his son. The redemption through Jesus Christ, that redemption of you if you're actually trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, from those sins that would have condemned you to that pit of fire that we're going to be looking at next week through the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the Passover was a reminder of that redemption out of Egypt. It was also a reminder to the Lord Jesus Christ year by year, as we're going to see next time, of what it is that he was actually going to have to go through in order to bring salvation to his people. Well, because it was the Passover and because certainly Jesus would have celebrated the Passover each year with his disciples, his disciples asked the question, where do you want us to prepare to eat the Passover this time? Well, in response, Jesus said that he wanted, well, that he was sending two of his disciples to Jerusalem and that when they entered that there would be a man carrying a pitcher of water that would meet them as they entered the city that they were to follow him, and to the owner of the house that he entered, they were to say, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? At which time the owner would show them a large upper room already furnished and ready. That is where they were to prepare it. And so the disciples went. I, I suppose you'd say there's a certain amount of faith that was involved. They believed what Jesus said. They went to Jerusalem. They found everything exactly as Jesus had said. And there they prepared the Passover. Now again, we're shortly going to consider the Passover meal itself and the institution of the Lord's Supper, which is the reason why we have the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. Actually, we're doing this from week to week through the series that uh, Greg is preparing those devotionals on the Lord's Supper. But what I'd like for us to focus on this morning is how Jesus knew these things would happen as he said. How he knew the man would be there, that the owner of the house that he would go to would have this room ready for them to prepare the Passover, and how he knew this man would be willing to allow Jesus and his disciples to have the room for that purpose. Now, we need to see that this is more than foresight on the part of Jesus. He doesn't just look down, as it were, the quarters of time and see these things. I mean, there were people there who had these things, and they had to be willing to do these things as well. Basically, this was our Lord's foreordination. 
This was our Lord's sovereignty. This was his plan that he was working out in order to bring to pass everything that had been predicted in the scriptures. God has a plan, and he's working all things according to his will. So what I want us to consider this morning from this one example are two things. First of all, that Jesus is the Lord of history. He's the one who is in absolute sovereign control of everything that is taking place in this world. And secondly, I want us to apply that uh, to ourselves. I want us to see what that means for you personally in the things that the Lord has actually brought into your lives, the things that you may have to suffer, the things you may have to endure, and that the Lord is working those things together for good. So first of all, let's consider that Jesus is the Lord of history. Now here we have one example. But we have something more straightforward, as it were, in the letter of the Hebrews. Now in the opening chapter of that particular letter, the author is setting out to show the absolute superiority of Jesus Christ to absolutely everything in the Old Covenant. All of the Old Covenant sacrifices, mediators, priesthood, angels, I mean everything, Jesus is superior to everything that has come before him. And so he begins by introducing Jesus Christ in this way in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. I already mentioned that the author to the Hebrews is setting out to show how Jesus is superior to everything in the Old Covenant. Here he shows us how Jesus is superior to the prophets. Well, how is he superior? Well, the fact is God spoke through men, but in these last days he is speaking to us through his Son. He is greater than the Old Prophets or the Old Testament prophets as much as the heir of all things is greater than those who share in the inheritance. As much greater as the creator is greater than his creation. Jesus, the author says, is God. The radiance of God's glory. I mean, what creature could be the radiance of an infinitely glorious God? He himself is God. He is the exact representation of his nature. And he is the one who, as God, upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, to our point, let's focus on that last statement. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, the word uphold in the original language means a couple of things. It means to bear or to carry. Our Lord Jesus is the one who bears all things and carries them along according to the word of his power. Now this means at least two things. First of all, that Jesus as God bears all things up. In other words, he keeps everything in existence. Now one thing that is true about God that is not true about anything else, and that is the fact that God is independent. God is someone who does not depend on anyone or anything for anything that he needs. He doesn't depend on anything to keep him in being. The full reason for, the, for his existence lies in himself and not in anything else. We say that God is independent. He is the one who is self-sufficient. He exists in and of himself. But the same is not true of you. It's not true of me. We are dependent. Same thing is true about every other thing that God has created. And that means that the reason for your existence is not in you. The reason why you continue to exist is not in you either. You are created. You depend upon God for your existence. Now that's one thing, again, that, that what this means as far as Jesus bearing all things up. The next time you're tempted to think 
that you do not need God, just remember that apart from Him, you wouldn't even exist. If the Lord stopped holding you up, as it were, and bearing you along, you would simply vanish into nothingness. But of course, the Lord has ordained that none of His creatures are actually ever going to vanish into nothingness. All of us are going to exist from the time we come into being forever. That is God's plan. The big question is, where are we going to spend eternity? But now the fact that Jesus upholds the creation, that he bears it and carries it along, means something that's relevant to what we're looking at this morning. Because he bears it and he carries it along to its God-ordained end. That's basically the second meaning of this word, to uphold. Jesus is the one who is moving all the events of history along according to the plan of God. There are absolutely no exceptions to that rule. Every event of nature is under his control. Every action of mankind is completely in his control. And the Lord, of course, can do this because he is God as well as man. In other words, the Lord is absolutely sovereign over every decision that is made, over every thought that is thought, over every word that is spoken, over the good actions and the evil actions of mankind. The Lord is absolutely sovereign over everything, everything. Now we need to take a look at this for a moment because there's a couple of different mistakes that we can make with this doctrine. Some people believe the idea of God's sovereignty means that you and I are nothing more than simply robots. That we really have no choice as to what we do when we choose to do something good. We're doing it because God ordained we would do it. If we choose to do something evil, God ordained that we would do that. We really had no choice uh, even choosing whether we would receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That was all foreordained by God. It's a part of his plan, which means that we really had no real choice in the matter. We were compelled to do it by God. Well, first of all, you need to realize that that is not the way God does things. The Lord is infinitely wise and infinitely powerful, and he has a way of actually carrying out the things that he does and rendering them that, they're, that they'd be absolutely certain to take place through the free actions or decisions of men and not by forcing anyone. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he never forces anyone to do anything that is contrary to what they really want to do. Everyone in the world is free at every moment to choose what it is they want according to the choices that God sets before them, without being forced by God to choose one or the other. Now, I did say they're free to choose what they want. It doesn't mean that they can choose contrary to their nature. That's, that's a, well, that's something we recognize as true. Their, their will is bound by their heart, and they're going to choose what their heart wants. Everybody can choose what they want in their heart, but they can't choose what their heart doesn't want. Again, that's... The idea of freedom, man is free, but he doesn't have the ability to choose Jesus Christ apart from his grace. But again, this is the essence of human freedom. We are free at every moment to choose what we want as we look at the decisions or the opportunities that are presented to us. And yet, the Bible says, in choosing what it is we want to do, we're actually making the choices God planned that we would make. And he is working all of these choices together, both the good choices that his people make as well as their bad choices, and the evil choices of the unconverted to his good ends. I mean, the Lord can do that. He is infinitely wise. He is infinitely powerful. He is able to use even the evil that exists in this world to accomplish his good purposes. Now, let me just point out this because, the, you know, again, this is the, the problem. Because God sovereignly works out his will according to our free choices, everyone in the world is still responsible for the choices that they make. And so are either going to be rewarded by the Lord or punished by the Lord for the choices that they make in the end. In other words, God's sovereignty 
does not mean that we're not responsible for our choices. What we do, we do, we choose. Therefore, God holds us accountable. Now, the point in all of this is, again, that Jesus is sovereign over history. He's in absolute control of every event, of every decision, of every action of everyone that exists in the universe. And I have to include the universe because who knows where the angels and demons are. He's also sovereign over them. This is just part of the uh, authority that has been entrusted to the Lord Jesus Christ as our mediator. You know, uh, our, uh, the Son of God has, has done this from the very beginning, uh, moving everything along according to human history. But now that he's become an, a man and exalted to the right hand of God and all authority and power has been entrusted to him, as, as the God-man, he is now overseeing all of these events. That's what the author to the Hebrews tells us, that Jesus Christ upholds all things by the word of his power, which means he is bearing it up and moving it along according to God's sovereign plan. This is a part, again, of his mediation. So with regard to the events unfolding in our passage, Jesus didn't look forward in time to see whether or not there would be a man carrying a pitcher who would lead them to another man who owned a house, who had a furnished upper room, who would be willing to let them use this for the Passover. Jesus actually made this happen in a way that he would be sure, in the same way that, that he would be sure when he sent his disciples into the city to find the donkey, that the donkey would be there and that the owners would be willing to let the disciples take the donkey so that Jesus could ride into Jerusalem on the donkey and fulfill scripture. Jesus is the Lord of history. And again, remember that Jesus did this in such a way that nobody was forced to do these things against their will. They did these things because they wanted to do these things, but in doing these things, they were doing exactly what Jesus had planned so that he might spend that last evening with his disciples celebrating the Passover. So now that's, that's the principle. Okay, Jesus is in sovereign control of all things. But now let's consider for a few moments the implications of this for your life and for my life. What this means is that nothing that happens in your life or in my life happens by accident. Everything that you encounter, everything that you do, has been planned by God, is being directed by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is in absolute, complete control of everything. You see, he has to have control of everything where he's really in control of nothing. Everything has to be right where he wants it to be, exactly what he, you know, in, in the state he wants it to be. If there's anything outside of his control, it could feasibly mess up his plan. So he has absolute control of everything. Now again, let's make sure we understand what this means and what it doesn't mean. Now the Lord is in control of all things. That means that when we're tempted to sin, that's also within God's control. It's within his power. But it doesn't mean that when the Lord presents to you a temptation, the fact that he sovereignly brought it into your life, although he's not the one who is tempting you. Of course, we know the Lord arranges it so that other creatures will do that. But we do know if it comes into our life, it has to be a part of his plan. The fact that it's there doesn't mean that, oh, I can do it because God has brought it. No, it's never okay to sin, even though the Lord sovereignly brings it into your life. The Lord always expects you to make the right choice, to do the right thing. In every situation that you face, even though he brings them sovereignly into your lives, you are still responsible for everything that you do, every action that you create or that you make, because you are choosing either to do it or not to do it of your, as it were, free will. But it does mean that the Lord has sovereignly brought the temptation into your life to test you to see whether or not you would do the right thing. Actually, he knows. So even more, it's to show you whether or not you will do the right thing under those conditions. But even when the Lord you know, does these things, he does it for 
many good reasons. We have to see that. God's sovereign plan, I'm talking about for his people now, for those who trust him, is, is always something good. Now, if you face the temptation and you resist the temptation, well, the Lord has worked some good out of that. He's actually shown you that by his grace, he has strengthened you to the point where you can resist temptation and do the right thing. But even when that temptation comes and you fall into sin, God is still working good things out of it by, again, his, his sovereignty. and his sovereignty, he can do that. These, if you fall into sin, it will help you to be more careful in the future, more watchful over your heart. Uh, you will be more careful to stay away from the things that you're tempted by. And, of course, the Lord will also help you to help other people deal with temptation. Whatever we experience, whatever we learn in life, the Lord is able to use that to help other people as well. Now again, secondly, this doesn't mean that if you are sick or suffering, that the Lord is the one who afflicted you any more than he's the one who's actually tempting you. He doesn't tempt you to sin. God doesn't actually afflict you either, at least directly, but we have to say, yes, it's still a part of his plan. Now God's not the one who created the sickness, as it were, and, and made you sick. Sickness is the result of the fall. Sickness is in this world. And because it is, you're going to get sick. And you're going to suffer. As a matter of fact, uh, there are many who believe, although there is no record in Scripture, that Jesus may very well have had a cold. He may have had the stomach flu. He may have had those kinds of sicknesses that we have to endure in life so that he might experience all that we experience. But of course, when he went through it, he didn't sin, as we often do when we don't feel good. Now, yes, it's true that the Lord could prevent us from getting sick if he wanted to, just like he could prevent every evil thing from happening in the world. But God doesn't do that because it's not part of his plan. His plan is to use that evil even the natural evils in life, to bring about good things in your life and to bring about glory to his name. You know, the Lord, in his plan, actually allowed sin to enter into the world through the one man he created, Adam. But he didn't rid the world of it instantly once Adam fell because it was his plan that it come into the world so that he might work good out of it. And that's why evil remains is so God may work good out of evil. Again, it shows his infinite glory and power and wisdom. And we might ask the question, what good can God bring out of sickness? Well, actually, several things. First of all, you know as well as I do that when you get sick, first thing you think about is how good it felt when you weren't sick. And it helps remind you of how thankful you should be for the times that you are feeling well and not sick. So it helps us, first of all, to not take for granted uh, what the Lord does give to us. I mean, sometimes we're just walking around complaining, and then suddenly we get sick, and then we realize how good we had it before we got sick, and then we stop complaining about it. Okay, so it reminds us of the Lord's goodness to us uh, when we're healthy. Second, it can certainly make us more careful uh, to guard the health that our Lord actually gives to us, uh, to be better stewards of our bodies. It can help us also to help others do the same thing, realizing, of course, that what the Lord is teaching us is to obey the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. You know, don't murder yourself. Don't murder other people. Uh, don't do anything that would take away a person's life. Don't do anything that would that would make you sick or take away your life. Instead, promote health, promote your life, preserve it, uh, take care of yourself and help others take care of themselves. Sickness can remind us to do that. It can teach us actually how to do that. Well, thirdly, it can also teach us how to draw comfort from the Lord. Because when we are sick, God actually does give us comfort. And when we are sick, it drives us to look for it. Uh, when, we're, when we're well, when everything is going well, 
We don't really look to the Lord very much. Uh, we should, but we don't. But one of the reasons why the Lord actually afflicts us is so we will look to Him. And when we look to Him, we find His comforts and we find His strength. And that's a, that's a good thing. It actually teaches us that we ought to do that even when we're feeling good. But when we find that comfort and we find that strength and we ourselves are delivered from that affliction, well, when we run into somebody else who's going through the same thing, then we're going to be able to take what we've learned and apply it to them. And that's going to be a great blessing, not only to us, but also to them. Now, we don't always have to experience what other people are going through in order to help them, but you know as well as I do that if you have gone through it, it certainly helps because you can enter into their suffering. You know what they're going through. You can connect with them, and you can help them for that reason. So again, God doesn't afflict you with the sickness directly, as it were, but he allows it, and he allows it for good reasons. There are always good reasons behind what he does. Now, the same thing is true of any difficulty that the Lord has actually planned to bring into our lives. And there are going to be many. There's going to be financial hardships. I mean, some of us are going through them now. If you're not now, you will sometime in the future. Family tensions, persecutions, problems in the workplace, broken relationships, there's going to be a myriad of disappointments. There's going to be a myriad of things that you're going to have to face. I mean, we all would like to believe that when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ that everything is just going to be great. All my problems are over, and now it's just a matter of smooth sailing all the way to heaven. But as a matter of fact, it's not that way. Things were actually going smoothly before you came to Jesus because there was no struggle, no battle. You can just choose sin at will at least as much as society will allow you to. But now that you're a Christian, you have to fight against that old nature. You have to, uh, again, endure what the people of the world might bring against you. And, of course, the Lord's going to be bringing things into your life to teach you lessons. It's not an easy life. It's hard. But it's good. Because God tells us, He's given us the promise that He's going to be with us through all of those difficulties. These have all come because that's what he's wanted, and he's wanted it for some good reason. He's going to work good out of it, not only for you, but also for others, so that God might receive glory. Now, knowing that the Lord is in control is going to help us to be able to do something that Paul actually commands the Thessalonians to do, and sometimes we look at this passage and say, how can we do this? He says, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I do think that it's, you know, it's, it's instructive to us that he does say in everything and not for everything. Because some things that the Lord brings into our lives, if, is we, if we just consider those things by themselves, would be hard to give him thanks for I mean, should you thank the Lord if your vital organs fail, if your liver stops to work, stops working, your kidneys? Should you thank the Lord if you're afflicted with chronic illness, if you lose your job and you can't find employment, if you have to face severe temptations, or if you're faced with broken relationships, or if one whom you love dies apart from the Lord who did not trust him? I don't know if the Lord wants us to thank him for those things, but because those things are really the result of the fall. Uh, the Lord, I don't think, expects us to thank him for that, you know, those natural evils or those moral evils. But because the Lord sovereignly brings good things out of these things in our lives, he does expect us to thank him in these things. Because we should know by now it is better that we be faced with these things than not faced with these things, even with regard to our temptations, even with regard to our falls into sins. God works those things together for good, which means that we can thank the Lord in everything because we know that all that he, is bring, all he brings, he brings out of his love, and he brings for our good. 
that we might actually become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way. Sometimes it doesn't seem like we're finding the comfort, finding the help. Sometimes it just seems to stir up our flesh and we feel awful. And yet, at the end of that dark tunnel is actually a, you know, a, a well, that, that brightness, that, uh, that blessing of God. As we see the good things that are brought out, we have to go through the difficulties first. You know, as David writes Psalm 23, and he talks about even going through the valley of the shadow of death, that he was able to, again, walk with the Lord and know that God was going to bring him through that. And as the Lord brings him through it, he gives God even more praise and glory for what he has learned through that. So th think of it in these terms. The plan that the Lord has for your life and the one that he is actually bringing you through right now is tailor-made just for you. So that rather than thinking about how you might wish that your life was completely other than what it is now, and I think all of us do that from time to time, instead you should thank the Lord that it is what it is because what it is is exactly what he wants it to be. What it is is exactly what is going to work together for your good. It is what you need. God is in control. Jesus is in control, and he's working all these things together for your good. But again, let me just remind you of this one thing. Do not use the fact that the Lord is working these things together for good as ever as an excuse to sin. Okay, we know he's going to work good out of it. We know it's going to be a hardship. We know that all these things have come because of his will. But that never gives us an excuse to make the wrong choices when we are going through these things. We have to make the right choices at all times. The fact that God is going to take our wrong choices and work those together for good does not give us an excuse to make the wrong choices, to sin so that good may come. As a matter of fact, we're expressly forbidden from doing that by Paul in Romans 6, verses 1 through 2. If my sin gives God the opportunity to glorify his grace... Let's just sin it up so that God can really do it, you know, really give glory to himself. No. Paul says, God forbid. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? We don't sin so that God can glorify his grace. He'll have plenty of opportunities to do that in our lives. We need to resist sin and do what is right. Instead, we should be thankful that the Lord can and does use these difficulties in life, even our afflictions and our sufferings and even the sinful things we do, that he can work all that together for your good and my good and for his glory. By the way, let's not forget as well that in God's sovereign plan, he gives us a generous helping of blessings that don't come by way of trial and suffering. We need to make sure we thank him for those things as well. Now let me just close by saying this, that this promise that we've been looking at, that, I mean, the fact that Jesus is in sovereign control, the promise that he's going to work all these things together for our good, you do need to remember that that's only true if you are actually a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're actually trusting Jesus Christ, turning from your sins and following him from the heart because that's what you want to do because you love him. You see, if you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, the things that he brings into your life is, is not necessarily working together for your good. It may ultimately work together for your destruction if you do not trust Jesus Christ and turn to him in faith and turn away from your sins. Now, if you do turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you do trust in him, then what you will discover is this, that all those things that did happen to you in your past all those sins and difficulties and things that you had to face, the Lord actually did work them all together for your good because through those things he actually brought you to Jesus Christ. But you will certainly have the promise from that point on that everything that happens in your life, the Lord will work together for your good. So if you're not trusting Jesus Christ, remember it doesn't apply unless you do. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, then trust him this morning. Listen to him as he calls you again to come to himself and respond. 
receive his forgiveness, receive his life. And then the promise that this one who is in sovereign control of all things, that he's going to work it all together for your good, will actually apply to you. Well, may the Lord again grant his mercy and his grace to each one of us to receive his word. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And let's ask that the Lord would help us apply what we've heard.